scientifically, oncologically safe. These were the six landmark studies that showed you with long-term follow-up that there was no ambiguity on its safety. If you look at the Netherlands cohort, which was published in 2016, that actually did suggest that for a smaller group of T1 tumors, BCT was probably better, but of course that's not randomized evidence and it was biased by the fact that that was probably radiation related. So knowing that we've got safety in early breast cancers for breast conservation surgery, why are we still discussing other concerns and looking at moving that forward? Most of the work comes from quality of life data because cosmesis is now gaining popularity. So women with mastectomies, and this is older data, and I'm going to thank Purvi for some of these slides, is older data from this did suggest that patients who had had mastectomies had lower body image scores, had lower sexual functioning scores, which were slightly better with the BCT group. There is an EORTC questionnaire analysis done through uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, where Dr. Parmar had done this years ago, where we actually saw that at about six months, women cope much better in India and breast conservation versus mastectomy didn't see that, that much difference. But again, I will say that that's a very select population. So it depends on each patient and you need to have discussed that with your patient. The bigger concern, and this is, I think, why you need to have a lecture like this, is quality of life doesn't just improve with a breast conservation surgery. It improves with good surgery. A simple breast conservation can give a patient excellent cosmesis and better quality of life than anything where we're trying to do things and we're unable to do the right outcome. There are multiple studies, and the import low study was actually about radiation, but what it did tell us that even with breast conservation, you've got a lot of adverse events related to both the appearance as well as the feel of the breast. Change in breast appearance is something that 20% of the patients reported in that study, and that was consistent over a five-year period of time. There are other concerns related to pain, swelling, sensitivity, and all of us who treat breast cancer patients and do breast conservations know that post-radiation, our patients do complain of a lot of pain and swelling at times. There's some breast edema that can develop also. Even though a lot of this may normalize, if you have not had this conversation with your patient, if she has not understood that atrophy and fibrosis is part of something that we may anticipate, that's necessarily a shock to them because they expect it to be as normal as it was before. So we actually tried to look at how many of our patients are concerned by reconstruction choices and cosmesis. And this was a survey that we ran among patients. It's not yet published. Prashant and I are actually working on this. Is 492 patients were surveyed. And we found that 82% of the patients who had had breast conservations were unhappy with their long-term cosmetic outcomes. And this is primarily because they don't realize how much the breast changes over the years. Looking at the mastectomy group, we had only about 16% who asked for WBR on follow-up. And when I'm saying that is this is a group that's had a mastectomy and is now on long-term follow-up, only about 16% of them wanted to consider reconstruction for the whole breast, suggesting that it was not such a concern for many of them. And it wasn't just financial reasons, and that's what will come out in the paper, is most of that was actually coping, having coped with breast cancer and concerns and excellent other options for the same. Which is what brings you to the fact that your decision for breast cancer is not just clinical pathological or patient related. It's a large plethora of treatment decisions that get taken, taking a whole bag of clinical factors, patient factors, as well as physician factors. Why I bring up physician factors is as we talk about more cosmesis and saying that as we are improving survival rates with our systemic therapy, quality of life, of course, has become an extremely important concern. We talk about a paradigm shift towards more cosmetic surgeries, more breast conservations, more oncoplasty. But how real is that actually? So the graph on the top, which is the one in white, is actually from the Western world. And it shows you that if anything, the number of mastectomies have gone up and mastectomies with reconstructions have gone up as against just BCTs with or without oncoplasty. So the BCT with oncoplasty would be that graph and the regular BCTs are without oncoplasty, sorry, is that graph. And the BCT with oncoplasty is a much smaller graph or a much smaller rise. And that's because you can get away with routine breast conservation for the smaller tumors and this 
depending on what your inherent risk of disease or recurrence is, and discussing mastectomies both for hereditary or familial cancers takes you towards a different question of prophylactic surgeries and more mastectomies and reconstructions. The graph at the bottom is actually what we saw at Tata Memorial. We haven't re-looked at this since in the recent past, but we did see that, yes, there is a rise in the number of reconstructions, but what was more important was that patients were more amenable to having breast conservation itself. So surgery for breast cancer has, the tenants are still very simple. Whether it's a mastectomy, whether it's a lumpectomy, you're talking about radical resection of the lump, oncological principles of a negative margin and staging of the axilla. This can be well achieved with a routine modified radical mastectomy or a routine breast conservation surgery. In trying to suggest that, you know, go ahead, we are increasing our numbers of breast conservation, we tried to look at how many patients or how many surgeons across India actually do this. And many of the surgeons on this group will have participated in the survey that we ran last year where we had 72 participants who responded to the survey in trying to understand how many do or do not offer their patients breast conservation surgery. 82% of, of the surgeons did suggest that they offer early breast cancer patients amenable for breast conservation the same, but those who did not offer breast conservation actually suggested inadequate training in breast surgery as a concern. So that's what brings us back to patient and physician factors is sometimes it's as simple as how comfortable you are with the procedure, whether or not you're able to offer it to your patient. So training in oncology and breast surgical oncology for that matter, I think is extremely important and it's something that needs to be considered well. While you're trying to understand, is breast conservation an option? You first need to understand cosmesis in, as a concept. Breast cosmesis, and this is something published in the Journal of Plastic Surgery in 2012. It was done through a survey of multiple breasts that were looked at and opinions given. And the four key features that they did coin down upon was that the proportion of the breast, upper pole to lower pole of 45 to 55 was considered ideal or aesthetic. The angulation of the nipple needed to be slightly upwards with a 20 degree angle. The upper pole was slightly concave and the lower pole was convex. Understand that this is what we look at as an ideal aesthetic breast. So when we're looking at various oncoplastic or breast conservation procedures, this is your aim or what you try to achieve for your patient. When you've looked at breast conservation surgery, how different is oncoplastic surgery and what does it actually entail? So when it was originally coined in the 1980s, it was more about advanced disease and talking about uh, integration of adjuvant therapy with conservative breast surgery. It has now become colloquial to accept it as a cosmetic procedure for breast conservation surgery, and it's primarily associated with displacement or replacement techniques. It's effectively a marriage of plastic surgery to oncological principles in trying to get an aesthetically amenable or ideal breast. So what are you aiming to achieve with oncoplastic surgery is that you're looking at a group of women who with routine breast conservation surgery or a wide excision would have unacceptable cosmetic outcomes and which is why you want to bring in additional procedures of plastic surgery. What oncoplasty actually allows you to do is over and above breast conservation for offering it in larger tumors or bigger volumes of excision for that matter and allowing more women to be able to have breast conservation surgery. Preoperative considerations, and I cannot reiterate this more and more, is for all types of breast conservations, and I don't just mean oncoplasties. Your patient must be informed well, and this is what we talked about even for cosmetic outcomes and adverse events related to breast conservation, is informed consent is the baseline of how your patient is going to respond to the surgery she has both understanding the risks that are involved, the asymmetry, the additional procedures that may be needed, additional corrections that may be needed, as well as complications and morbidity of healing that may occur. Photographs are something that we now all insist on, specifically because there are asymmetries in all women's breasts. 
most people don't notice them, but they become more apparent to you post-surgery when you're looking at yourself. And because of that, if you're able to show them a preoperative photograph, that's something that you can point out that was already there. Integrating that into your routine practice, even for routine breast conservation, is a good practice. Skin marking is something you need to do in an upright sitting position. It's something that needs to be done preemptive to the surgery, and it allows for you to mark and plan your surgi surgical procedure better. The relevant landmarks start with you marking the footprint of the breast, and that's the inframammary crease, the anterior axillary fold, the sternal border, the superior border of the breast. In addition, you also often mark the periareolar circle and or the wise pattern landmarks if that's what you're taking forward from there. So is a routine breast conservation, that is a wide excision with a scar placed over the tumor, is that going to walk, be something that we do away with and now move towards oncoplasty? I would have to disagree with that. Primarily because the scar that you place over the tumor is not the problem. Often enough, and if you can see that in the photograph below, that fades with time if done well. If it's taken along the crassal crease, if it's taken without skin tension, if there is good approximation, it will fade with time to a point that you are not able to see it. You still need to maintain the basic tenets of cosmetic breast surgery, which is your nipple areolar position, the mound of the breast, and rearranging the gland to get the ideal aesthetic breast. It isn't necessarily the placement of only the incision that takes that forward. So what do you need to do when you're planning any breast conservation, let alone oncoplasty, is understand first what your volume of excision is, what your tumor location and breast size and ptosis is, and what is the density of the breast. Each of these factors is actually going to deal with what is your outcome of the surgery and what your aesthetic outcomes are going to be. <coughs> Excuse me. Skin, excision, skin and gland excision volumes have often been talked about as the primary concern related to what's going to lead to the deformity. Yes, an average of about 20 to 30% of breast volume is what you can probably excise in a medium-sized breast. Anything over and above 80 grams of tissue being taken out from a medium or a B-cup-sized breast is probably going to cause a deformity. With anything less than that, simple techniques of glandular approximation suffice. And oncoplastic techniques will probably be reserved for larger excisions, more volume excisions, allowing you to offer on breast conservation to additional group of women, not just the ones who could have routine breast conservation surgery. Unfortunately, there are certain tumor locations or quadrants in the breast that even for a routine wide excision may have aesthetically unpleasing outcomes. Those would be the inner quadrant or the upper inner quadrant, primarily because that's your social crease or your social cleavage and the lower central quadrant because that tends to cause a bird beak deformity when not approximated well. You need to take that into account. You need to take the size of the breast into account before planning that. Now this is a very busy slide which says type of defects and depending on the size and the ptosis and what I'm going to basically bring you to is just this. What this group of um, people have looked at is, this was what was published and this is kind of what is followed across, is depending on the size of your breast and the volume of the breast that you have and the ptosis, you're going to have different defect sizes depending on the extent of tissue that you excise. Each of that will be different. So I cannot tell you that for every 20 grams of tissue or 80 grams of tissue, you can do a breast conservation. For a a cup size breast, even 80 grams of tissue may be a lot, and that's effectively a large defect in a small volume breast, or what they would call a type 1AC defect. And that requires severe, that causes severe distortion and requires additional procedures. So you need to again understand, and I keep reiterating the same thing, that it's not a single point that decides how, what your procedure is. It's a group of concerns both from volume of excision, type of tumor, size, extent, size of breast, quadrant of tumor, all of which will decide what your procedure of choice is. 
I put this slide up often when I discuss oncoplasty to say that it's very, it's wonderful to know how to do a reduction. It's an excellent procedure to do. You do a good therapeutic mammoplasty and you get an excellent response for a patient. But if you're not correcting the contralateral side, and she has grade three ptosis, if not more, on the contralateral side, this is not a cosmetically acceptable result. So to say that the ipsilateral side looks wonderful and you've done a great job is not enough when you're talking about oncoplasty. <coughs> this is uh, something that some of us follow, but it's not really as absolute as it, it just gives you a chart which tells you with increasing tumor volume excision or breast size excision and increasing tum breast size, what are you able to offer your patient? So the larger breasts, even larger volumes, you may be able to just do a simple wide excision. Do you need to do volume replacements for smaller breasts, even for smaller volume excisions, is what you need to take into consideration when you're choosing to evaluate your patient. When you're looking at doing any kind of glandular mobilization, you need to understand what the breast density is. And this is both clinical as well as radiological. Breast density is basically telling you what is the fat composition on that mammogram or within the breast versus the glandular element. And if you plan large reshaping of the breast in a fatty breast, you're basically putting yourself up for large amounts of fat necrosis and healing issues. So you, an optimal procedure depends both on what you need to excise what that breast would allow you to excise, but also what you can or cannot move about or how much fat there is in that breast. So again, when you have thought about various procedures and if you're talking about small volume excisions, do you need to discuss everything as an oncoplasty, hide every incision, put it in areas that aren't seen? Every incision has to be periareolar, inframammary. Honestly, it's about the ease of access to tumor because it's still oncology. That needs to be your primary concern. Yes, placing it along a tension-free line, placing it so that you are getting tension-free closure needs to be looked at so you get cosmetically better scars and they fade with time. Only areas that you would want to avoid direct scars, even for small early breast cancers, would be upper inner quadrants and central quad lower inner central and maybe lower central quadrants, and of course, vertical scars across the upper pole and lower pole. Skin involvement has to be excised. So when you're talking about a country like ours, where 35% of our patients have locally advanced cancers, we do see a significant number of patients with skin involvement. That overlying skin or anterior margin has to be excised and in those situations. So when you talk about oncoplasty and what is the ideal incision based on what tumor location, you will get multiple published literature which will tell you this is what you could consider for this quadrant, that is what you could consider for that quadrant. And yes, there, most of them are used as templates by us, but it is not absolute. It's dependent on both your patient and her tu the tumor characteristics. Also, please understand the first thing you need to be able to do is be oncologically safe before looking at anything further. So your oncological principles do not change. It is a wide excision without any compromise on margins and you must place clips on the base. If you are doing large glandular mobilization, please consider talking to your radiation oncologist about additional layer of clips on the margins that are being mobilized because they may need to identify that as that is one of the concerns with oncoplasty and radiation is that the margin that's excised and then mobilized may not lie in the field of the original tumor bed. So when you look at oncoplasty out over and above breast conservation surgery, you have multiple classification systems. There was Huffman's classification, there's Krishna Klopp's classification, there's Urban's classification, and all of them primarily say more or less the same thing, which is what now the American Society of Breast Surgeons has come down to. So when you talk of a level one oncoplasty, effectively rearrangements, some of the examples would be a crescent or a donut mastopexy. If you're looking at level 
two oncoplasts. That's where you somewhere between 20 to 50 percent of the breast parenchyma and you now need to rearrange the gland to form shape again and those are what the reduction mammoplasty designs look at over and above 50 percent unless you're reducing both sides would require some sort of volume replacement and that could be both with local flaps with um, free flaps or implant or expander based reconstructions so a level one oncoplasty is where you are looking at closing the parenchyma in a well-done breast conservation surgery. So the fibroglandular tissue of the breast is very well supplied and you, it allows you to move it around a lot without major devascularization or necrosis. But when you're doing a dual plane mobilization, you need to be very careful with that because in that you are going to mobilize both the skin and of the muscle and that is a risk for fat necrosis. So you need to know that that's dense glandular parenchyma and not a fatty breast. So this procedure would effectively mean a skin incision either placed over the tumor in Kressel's lines or some hidden scars which is periareolar or inframammary crease or lateral mammary crease undermining the skin in the plane of a subcutaneous mastectomy. And that subcutaneous plane must extend beyond your lumpectomy site. You then can, you can go up to about two thirds of the breast skin envelope for that. You wide excise your tumor with oncological margins and then full thickness reapproximation by raising just off the muscle so as to be able to bring it together and close. Minor nipple areolar repositioning is sometimes offered in these sort of situations, depending on how much shifted with that wide excision that you did. So this is effectively what it does, is you have to be able to bring the cavity together by dual plane mobilization, but most of your mobilization is at the skin and your muscle is level is only to bring it together so it falls together, allowing you to close it into layers. And I cannot say this more, is simple breast conservation based procedures are still standard of care for early breast cancers as long as they give you a cosmetic result. You do not have to hide the scar and do complex procedures for every breast conservation surgery. So in these small defects, do you always have to close the breast parenchyma or can you get away with just a seroma formation? So there are two schools of thought. One says that closing the parenchyma and, and mobilizing the parenchyma allows you to get better volume there. Post radiation, there's less fibrosis, there's less defect. The second group, of course, suggests that the seroma formation allows that. I think a lot of that has to do, again, with the volume of breast tissue excised compared to the size of the breast, the quadrant in which it was done, and how much of this is going to actually cause fat necrosis because of the radiation. So if you've had dual plane mobilization and a fatty breast, whether or not you've mobilized and closed it with approximation or you allow the seroma to form, you're not going to get good cosmesis because you will result in fat necrosis in a fatty breast with large mobilization. So which is what brings you to what needing to plan your oncoplasty. If you're looking at level one oncoplasties, most of them can be done with simple incisions placed directly over the tumor and good mobilization of the parenchyma, giving it contour and volume. But if you look at taking it forward, there are certain templates, like I said, which describe what is the most common incision. I think what you need to take away from that is that when you're doing a donut mastopexy, or a Benelli mastopexy, you do not want to offer it for the lower quadrant lesions because that tends to, it, it may not necessarily fall well. And I think I'll leave that to the other experts on the team to also describe to you. When you're looking at batwings or hemi batwings, which most of us don't really prefer doing anymore, those are something you probably place in the upper quadrants and the upper central quadrant. So describing some of the other procedures or the incisions, these are simple type one level oncoplasties that are done. A parallelogram incision allows you to excise a wider volume of skin. So if you have skin involved over the tumor and you need to excise that, planning your incision as a parallelogram rather than an ellipse allows you to excise more skin and close your tumor. It will move your nipple areola the least as compared to a routine ellipse. 
something like a batwing mastopexy. And like I said, most of us don't use these very routinely. But it's excellent if you have a patient who has an upper central very close to the NAC and you're going to be able to save the NAC. It may move the nipple areola a little. You may need to adjust that with the contralateral breast and you can just do a nipple repositioning on the contralateral side. But again, if you have not marked that pre-op, you will not be able to anticipate that later. The donut or the round block Benelli technique of the mastopexy is something that has become very popular among people starting onchoplasties and it allows you to hide the scar around the nipple areola. And I will say that yes, it's an excellent technique and it's a good option, but it does not take away from a routine wide excision, placing the scar aesthetically. So when you look at that, if you've got a 41 year old lady, and this is someone where I would think that we would probably want to consider the Benelli rather than just any other wide excision in other parts of the breast, is if you've got a lady who's got an incision on in the upper inner quadrant, and that's an area of a social cleavage, and you want to hide that scar because that's something that may cause concerns later, and you're going to get a defect in the upper inner quadrant, this is where you probably want to discuss an oncoplasty or a round block with your patient. So this is one of our cases where we've got a large upper inner quadrant lesion. She's got a wide areola. She's got a C-cup sized breast. We've gone in into the mastectomy plane, subcutaneous plane, excised the tumor, placed our clips on the bed. You always mark your specimen. The specimen would have short, superior, long lateral. In cases where we have not excised the skin, we also take a black stitch on the anterior. Again, just to show you that the weight of this tissue is about 80 grams. So could she have just had a routine BCT? Probably yes. But in trying to hide the scar so as to avoid the social cleavage is where we've done an oncoplasty. So when you close this and she sits up, it did not need an adjustment to the contralateral side. And this is a photograph which is actually pre-radiotherapy. She should follow up soon enough post-radiotherapy. Similar things with partial or crescent-shaped hemi-round block techniques can be considered for outer quadrants and inner quadrants, but again, dependent on what the size of your parenchyma is. Central tumors are something that we all have struggled with. Now, a central tumor, if you just take a wide ellipse and you excise it, there's actually probably nothing wrong with it, but you lose a little projection because of that. In wanting to keep the projection, you need to consider other techniques. Now, these other techniques could be a bat wing, which allows you to raise the breast and recreate the mound giving projection, or doing a grissotti. Please understand in doing a grissotti, even though it sounds very exciting and it's you did a fabulous oncoplasty, you need to have assessed whether she has adequate tissue laterally that you can rotate into the breast and use, or you will have an empty lateral pole when you plan that. So some of, some of the other techniques, simple rotation plasties, like a V-plasty v or a J-plasty, allow you to excise skin and rotate the rest of the parenchyma in. You will notice that we've done a little bit of uh, nipple repositioning in this, nipple areola repositioning in this, because the rotation plasty moves the nipple areola towards the side of the rotation. So we've de-epithelized on the contralateral side this lady has actually just finished radiation and we should get images post radiation also. When you're looking at an oncoplasty, which is for a small breast, small volume, those are options you can consider. You need to understand that level two oncoplasties require a lot more training, require a lot more planning, and it's not as simple as that. So a level two oncoplasty, most of them fall within the WISE pattern markings that you have and you would be able to do either a superior or a superomedial or an inferior pedicle oncoplasty with them. You need to plan your wise pattern well so that your closure is not under tension and you cannot place the nipple too high or you get what is known as a sunrise nipple that is when she raises her and that's extremely discomforting for these women. So routine superior pedicles would be planned for patients with lesions anywhere within the Weiss pattern marking of the lower quadrant. An inferior pedicle is a fabulous flap to consider for someone with an upper quadrant lesion. But again, I would reiterate that these procedures tend to require contralateral corrections and your patient needs to be willing for that. 
So is there a choice of technique and an incision? Again, little bit of it is based on what your patient can, her, what her breast allows, what your volume of excision is, and also based on your expertise. Often enough, you can just shift the wise pattern markings a little to be able to take the same wise patterns with lesions on the lower pole or inner or outer quadrants. <coughs> Taking that further is what if you do not have adequate breast tissue to rearrange and you need to replace tissue. You have various autologous tissue flaps, which is whether it's the perforator flaps, whether it's the free flaps that you're looking at, and you always have the option of an implant and an expander. The perforator flaps that are now becoming very popular are the light caps, the mic cap, and the AI cap, and of course the L tap. And I think one of your questions on your quiz was related to this. In trying to understand each of these flaps, understand that you first need to have assessed whether your patient has adequate tissue that you can use for it. In a TE or a MICAP that you plan, if your patient does not have adequate bulk on this low fold below your inframammary crease, you cannot rotate it to recreate the bulk for the lower quadrant. These are robust flaps based on perforators that you can find with the, uh, a handheld Doppler. Most of us tend to use a handheld Doppler while doing this. The TE flap is something that you can probably do without it because you know exactly where it's located. It's within five centimeters of the ziffy sternum, and this is because that's the, where the thoracoepigastric artery comes out of it. The AI cap is something that, again, you need to have a robust pedicle in the anterior aspect. It's fabulous for lesions in the lower central. You're raising the same inframammary fold into the central quadrant by just taking these two limbs into the center and creating bulk there. So all of this can be done with or without skin excision of the overlying the tumor, depending on how close that is and whether that anterior margin is free or not. The LICAP again has, is something that has replaced what we used to routinely do for most latissimus dorsi flaps, specifically for outer and upper central lesions. The LICAP allows you to take out a large volume of breast tissue and replace it with the fold from the lateral aspect. The LTAP would be slightly higher in its marking than the LICAP. And if you can see with this young girl, we have been, we've had to take out overlying skin primarily because there was overlying skin involvement and replaced it with the LICAP underneath that. Now, what I will tell you is that even though these procedures are very exciting, between the LICAP, the LTAP, the AI cap, the MI cap, and all of these are just in costal perforators around the breast, each of them has a different pitfall. Sometimes the LICAP vessel is extremely short and that mesentery is not long enough for you to take all the way up to the upper central. The LTAP may not always be present and sometimes it's extremely small or thin and you cannot pick up big bulk of tissue on it. Often it's very closely related to the sentinel node or may get damaged in your axillary surgery. So what I will say is that reserve most of these flaps or advanced procedures, but only when you develop experience. And I'm going to give you an example of a case that Dr. Gita shared with us earlier, is that if you're looking at a patient and she was planned for an LTAP, and when you enter your axilla, you realize that the LTAP is actually quite a thin vessel and is probably not going to be robust enough for the volume of flap that you need to harvest. Looking at additional flaps, including the circumflex scapular or a branch of that, which is coming off it, is something that you could consider. It takes a large amount of experience to recognize whether your flap is going to be adequate on smaller perforators, whether this perforator is adequate, whether you need to supplement with another perforator, and planning your flap. It's basically you on your toes in the OT. Do not consider doing advanced procedures unless you've trained in them because you will run into trouble like this. This kind of outcome, this kind of result only comes with someone with that kind of experience that she has. It's not something that we would encourage everyone to try and do, which is why the one thing that you need to know as a flap is the workhorse flap, which is an LD flap. When you run into trouble with any of the perforators, you find an extremely small perforator that you cannot go in, the LD is your backup flap. 
It's currently used as the backup if your patient has a recurrence, if you're using an implant, or if you're considering a whole breast reconstruction using an LD. It's one of the most robust perforator or pedicle flaps that we have, and it is based on the thoracodorsal artery and subscapular artery from the axillary artery. These LD flaps can be used for small partial reconstructions, both for central for any quadrant in the breast. The pedicle is long enough to be able to mobilize all the way up to the lower inner quadrant of the breast. It can be used for extended whole breast reconstructions by excising larger volumes of fat from the back. And smaller breasts as well as larger breasts, again, dependent on whether the patient allows it. The extended indications of conservation have been published for the LD group of patients, and this was by Dr. Parma in, I think, 2010, where we looked at a large volume of local, uh, breast conservation surgeries with reconstruction using a latissimus dorsi flap, and we found that at a median follow-up of 36 months, and there is an updated follow-up that will come soon, is that the local recurrence and disease-free recurrence for the patients using an LD flap was no different than that of routine breast conservation, therefore suggesting that these wider volumes that we are trying to excise and take, extend the indications of breast conservation surgery were an option using the LD. Using perforator flaps, using level two oncoplasty techniques have allowed us to keep the LD in reserve. But I would still suggest that if you're starting out, this is probably one of the best flaps to start out with. Some patients, unfortunately, continue to need a mastectomy for some oncological reason or another, whether it's skin involvement and needing a locally in locally advanced cancers, whether it's skin sparing mastectomies or nipple sparing mastectomies for extensive DCIS or multicentric lesions that cannot have conservation. Oncoplasty also talks about reconstruction or whole breast reconstruction that is not reserved to just aesthetic outcomes of breast conservation surgery. So whether you're doing a whole breast reconstruction using an autologous flap in cases where you've had to excise skin and do a standard modified radical mastectomy, whether it's a nipple preserving or a skin preserving case where you've done a mastectomy and replaced it with autologous or uh, implants, you're effectively talking about, again, maintaining oncological principles before you do that. So these are some of the cases where we've looked at doing even skin sparing mastectomies and whole breast reconstructions. We still tend to use the LD to use as a cover over the implant in these cases, primarily because not always will you get an adequate cover with the pectoralis muscle and the serratus. If you have a large breast and you can use a, a fold of skin, which is known as the dermal sling, then yes, that's an excellent option in place of raising an LD over that. What I would also just re, uh, point out to, and this isn't something that is very robust evidence on, but there is a lot of talk now about using the ICG both for the perforators and the skin, native skin of mastectomies done, specifically when you're doing reconstructions on these patients, just to understand what area of your skin has adequate blood supply or not. There's a lot of ambiguity in literature currently on what the ICG predicts or not for the flaps, but many surgeons tend to use them. We've also used them in some cases. And yes, it does help with understanding that as long as you've got good blood supply within your flap, you're probably safe for reconstruction there. Every single procedure in breast oncology or breast surgery will have some complications associated with it. Over and above the routine complications of breast surgery, oncoplasty is fraught with the concerns of poor cosmesis if not planned appropriately. Nipple and skin necrosis that can happen, fat necrosis again with a poorly planned case, and delayed healing that may affect your oncological outcomes if the next adjuvant is not given appropriately. So all of this can be minimized with appropriate training, understanding the anatomic planes, hemostasis, and planning the right patient for the right procedure. Complication rates are always higher in women with comorbidities, whether it's smokers, diabetics, or morbidly obese. All of this is fine as long as you have oncological safety. We've shown you oncological safety from extended indications using a latissimus dorsi flap. What about for routine 
level one and level two onchoplasties. So yes, there's a lot of literature that does discuss it. Some of this is from MD Anderson. This is where about 9,000 patients evaluated for breast conservation, breast conservation plus reconstruction, mastectomy, mastectomy plus reconstruction were looked at. Please understand all of this is primarily early breast cancers, and this is a very short follow-up for early breast cancers. But among the 1,100 patients that had had oncoplastic breast surgery, they suggested that the disease-free survival was as high as 94%, suggesting that there is evidence, growing evidence to suggest that it may be a safe option to consider. The meta-analysis published in 2014 suggested the same thing. Again, short follow-up for early breast cancers, so we do need more updated data. And I will reiterate repeatedly that all of this is early breast cancer data that they're showing you safety in only. Multiple other reviews, multiple other papers from various institutes and groups that look at safety of oncoplasty. Some of the long-term data of 50 months has suggested that there is a similarity in local recurrence with oncoplasty and routine breast conservation surgeries. Oncoplasty allows you to excise a larger volume and get a wider margin, therefore suggesting that the local recurrence may not be impacted in that group. But why is there so much stress on everyone needing to discuss this and not just with the patient, but with your multidisciplinary team? is because breast oncology is now something where you're using radiation therapy in more and more indications. Almost every node positive now gets adjuvant radiation. So if you're even talking about a mastectomy and you've planned an implant, that's a concern if you've not considered that you may get adjuvant radiation earlier. Breast conservations and the boost given planning the boost and as I had suggested, discussing with your radiation oncologist on how you're going to be able to mark the margin that gets displaced out of the bed also is something that you need to look at. So some of the things that have been suggested is of course placing clips in the base, placing clips along the margin which has been mobilized and helping your radiation oncologist identify that. Pre-op CT scans where they are able to mark the bed and then correlate that post-op with the oncoplastic bed. And of course, the biosorb. The biosorb is something that is stitched into the cavity while you are mobilizing it. And that's this. So this is stitched into the cavity while you're mobilizing the gland over and around it. Allowing, and it will absorb with time only with the clips that remain. And that gives you the area that the boost can be given. Larger boost volumes can have a negative impact on outcome of cosmesis. So that needs to be taken into consideration when you're planning your breast conservation. Of course, when you're looking at mastectomies, and like I said, even if you've got one node positive, we're now giving radiation to that group. So all of that comes into the planning pre-surgery as to understanding what your patient may end up getting post-op and what is going to impact cosmesis. Just as simple as saying that using IMRT may reduce the capsular contracture is not necessarily completely true. We are moving towards more direct to implant procedures where you're putting in implants rather than expanders to implants. But this is again something that you need to consider depending on how much radiation or what her risk of recurrence is. <coughs> Delayed immediate reconstruction gave us the advantage of deflating the expander while she was on radiation, allowing the radiation oncologist to contour their portals for that, and then later re-expanding and changing. However, there is data that suggests that delayed immediate reconstruction, that is delayed reconstruction, changing an implant later, may have higher implant failure rates. So you need to be able to plan both with your radiation oncologist as well as what your patient's breast and tumor allows to get a multidisciplinary approach for any oncoplastic surgery. And your patient, of course, is the cornerstone of this. I will say the more important thing specifically when you're starting out is be best friends with your plastic surgeon because she or he is going to bail you out more often than you hope not. Thank you. Amazing, amazing uh, talk, uh, Dr. Neeta. Uh, I'm just unmuting Dr. Vaishali. Uh, if Dr. Vaishali is there, she can unmute herself. 
and she can take on the discussion forward. Okay, Vishali, you can unmute yourself and you can take the discussion forward, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neeta. Uh, as usual, it was wonderful listening to you. And, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, it was. Uh, I mean, you have taken us through oncoplasty, uh, including everything, the classification, the, the the indications, the complications, different levels of oncoplastic procedures, and many procedures, including simple level one to level two and therapeutic mammoplasty, with. Uh, the details which are definitely required for the uh, new uh, budding uh, oncoplastic surgeons to understand. Uh, so far, we have a few questions. I'll take them one by one. Uh, as we all know that the especially level one oncoplasty requires dual plane undermining, and uh, in especially in uh, fatty breasts. The, the, the chances of fat necrosis are definitely high in case if you do not choose the patients appropriately for level 1 oncoplasty. So my question to uh, Dr. Neeta would be, how do you judge breast density? Is it just a clinical assessment or clinical and radiological both? What do you do? I would think that what we tend to do is both clinical and radiological because sometimes you will see a very totic breast and you will think that that's probably an empty breast and she has no gland there but when you get imaging on it you'll be able to see more glandular element there so it's a little bit of both and you need to have assessed that clear enough and uh, by radiology you mean gland. mammography uh, i mean mammography. Mammography. Yeah, right uh, and um, uh, uh, dr saurabh i think you've answered his question is that biosorb available in india so you've written that it's currently not. Biosorb is something that is available, is I think FDA approved and it's available only in the US. They are looking at moving into the European market, but not, and it's probably going to be extremely expensive anyway. Right. Um, uh, the other question is uh, Do you always do, I mean, this is a very oft repeated question, do you always do MR mammography for all the patients who are planned for? Uh, uh, we on, on do not plastic. do an MRI for every patient plan for breast conservation. Whether right. it's an oncoplasty right. or just a breast conservation, she will have a mammogram. Post-mammogram, right. if there is any ambiguity where there is clinical radiological discordance, then we right. consider uh, an MRI. And uh, 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 we would like uh, your views on... Uh, oncoplastic procedures after new adjuvant chemotherapy, especially in uh, locally advanced breast cancer. Uh, uh, and uh, to be precise, uh, patients who have had skin involvement before new adjuvant chemotherapy. So I am actually not a proponent of it. Um, I'm going to say that the first concern is identifying the right patient for breast conservation itself post new adjuvant chemotherapy is more important than right. discussing oncoplasty. Only right. if your patient is, um, is somebody that you think would have a lower risk of difference for a breast conservation versus a mastectomy, then you discuss cosme additional cosmetic procedures. Just yeah, because, yeah. So if it's the T3 that has downsized um, or there is extensive microcal that's yeah, there, yeah. then you could consider oncoplastic procedures just because it's a wider volume of excision. But if it's Correct. somebody who was the T4 lesion, has extensive skin involvement, I'd be very careful before planning that lady for breast conservation, let uh -huh. alone plastic uh -huh. procedures. So you probably look at the rest of the tumor biology before doing that. Right. And uh, the other leading question uh, to this is, what is your take on extreme oncoplasty? We are seeing many more uh, you know, papers being published on the safety of uh, extreme oncoplasty. So what is so your again, take on it? So again, extreme oncoplasty, and this is basically by Mel Silverstein's group, right. uh, has looked at a lot of work into more and more techniques of oncoplasty that can be done. Their group does right. not see the kind of locally advanced cancers that we do. So again, we it's do, the yes. same thing, looking at doing dual uh, pedicles, looking at doing larger volumes of excision and mobilizing all of that in someone who's a T1 to T3 lesion, where you're mm -hmm. basically, your concern is whether the boost of radiotherapy is going to be adequate or not. That's something that only long-term data will tell us. But if you're talking about it in what's a truly locally advanced cancer that we see here, I would think that you need to be a little bit more careful with that. Right. 
thank you. Uh, the other question is, how do you follow your patients after complex uh, breast oncoplasty, especially the breast imaging? How frequently do you do it? And what uh, imaging modality do you use for uh, uh, breast imaging? We are currently continuing the same policy as is for routine breast conservation. We do a clinical evaluation every six months. We do a mammogram every 12 to 18 months. Right. Okay. Uh, I think uh, these are all the questions which have been uh, so far uh, posted. So, so, Dr. Vishali, there are two more questions. One uh -huh. is Dr. Geeta. You can just look at the chat box. Okay. Okay. I'll just go through it. So, it's a comment by Dr. Geeta. Sorry. It's a comment by Dr. Geeta. It's a comment. Dr. Geeta, I'll unmute you so you can join in actually. Uh, and I have requested uh, Dr. Chintamani sir also to join in. Feel free to chip in. I'll just unmute Dr. Chintamani sir also. Uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar had to leave actually. So I think he is, uh, just left the group actually. So Dr. Geeta, you are uh, now unmuted. So my question was uh, to uh, Dr. Neeta ma'am that when the tumor is very close to axilla, how do we, how can we prevent that the two cavities do not communicate because the suction in axilla tends to distort the breast contour. Okay. So, which is where you plan your incision appropriately, where sometimes if it's that close to the axilla and you're doing a single incision breast conservation surgery, you're able to mobilize your gland appropriately so that the lateral contour still stays and the axilla is separate. So, that's where you plan your incision more appropriately, whether it's along the anterior axillary fold, whether it's a circumerular incision that's going to have, uh, be across the upper outer quadrant. And choosing to take a single incision in that sort of situation allows you to move the gland or rotate the gland up and approximate it rather than taking two separate incisions and then getting stuck. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Geeta, the... You see your Sorry. patient sitting up when you, and you mark it when she's sitting up. I think you'll probably get a better idea of how to plan that. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Geeta, there is a question from Dr. Saurabh Jain. Uh, he wants to know how sure are we radiologically in choosing patients for nipple sparing mastectomy? So, um, Geeta, do you want to take this? Uh, Dr. Geeta? Geeta is yeah, she's unmuted, but I think up. Uh, Dr. Dr. Geeta? Dr. Neeta, you can only take it. Okay. Yeah, 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 so, so I think what the question. Ah, there she is. Uh, yeah. Dr. Saurabh wants to know okay. how sure are we radiologically? Uh, I mean, when do you plan the patient for nipple sparing mastectomy? Which modality of uh, you know imaging do you use, and how do you make sure that the nipple is not involved? So the, the the image remains the same. So you know, if you really want to plan, I mean, I would do an MRI in such a situation. Because an MRI can really show you the enhancement which may be reaching up from a lesion which is say about two centimeters away from the nipple complex. But uh, when you actually do an MRI, you can see that the enhancement is actually leading on from that uh, lump to the nipple. And the other thing obviously which you would do at the time of surgery is uh, that if you're reasonably sure that it is not reaching up to the nipple and you actually go, go ahead and decide to do a nipple sparing, a frozen section is mandatory. I would not want to do a nipple sparing unless I have frozen control because if there is uh, any uh, any uh, evidence of tumor on frozen section at the base of the nipple, then nipple sparing mastectomy is out. You will just go ahead and do a skin sparing then. I think I would agree with that is because you're looking at procedures which are extending the indications for on uh, of oncology for cosmesis. So you want to be very sure that you're doing it in the right uh, patient and you're picking the right procedure for that patient. So maybe in that sense, looking at adding in additional imaging would help, but definitely adding in uh, the frozen sections at the end of surface of the NAC. Dr. Neeta, what about, what about uh, frozen section for breast conservation? You know, so we uh, the... routinely do not do frozen yes. section for breast conservation. Part of that is because most of what we see are palpable tumors. And if you're getting a wide margin, which is about a clinical relevant gross margin, the probability of getting a positive margin from that is less than 3 to 6%, which is what we've seen in our data. Um, 
often enough, um, you don't always pick up the CIS on a closing section margin. You may end up picking in more cuts on that and having wider excisions. It's something that you need to be able to talk to your pathologist about, but is it necessary? Absolutely not. Dr. Nita, excellent talk. Thoroughly Thank enjoyed you. it. And uh, Dr. Chintamani here. Thank you, sir. And I fully agree with you. Dr. Nita uh, uh, was very right in mentioning that frozen won't be uh, the gospel that you're looking at. But a lot of people would like to do a specimen radiograph, which would help. And like Dr. Geeta mentioned, nipple is just another margin, but we still got to be extremely careful oncologically to be correct in these cases and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It was, it was touching the most important aspects of oncoplasty that one should be careful about because it's, it's very often that we, we tend to get dragged into it uh, by doing one procedure or following the other, like you learn one and do the next one. So excellent talk. And I agree with what, she just mentioned about the frozen not being so uh, very effective in BCS all the time. There are, there, I mean, this concept is not very popular in England because they don't have too many pathologists, but in spite of that, they all are very keen on the radiograph. So your views on that, Dr. Deetha, how about specimen? So what thing? we do do is uh, we've actually just started a study which is looking at the use of ultrasound for margins. Um, it's a randomized study that we're looking at, but we're routinely using mammograms for uh, specimen mammograms where there's microcal. So where there's no microcal, we've not looked at mammograms. We're currently evaluating the role of ultrasound of the specimen there, but uh, we do not do additional cavity shaves. We've just done good wide excisions with gross margins that are adequate. I would like to add here, you see, if there is uh, no, you know, if your institution, you know, like I would say Tata Memorial is a very busy institution, I'm sure a closing section would really, you know, delude your pathologists and leave their, leave their jobs. You know? But uh, in our kind of situation in the private setup, we do use frozen section always, always for breast conservation surgeries. And we have been served well by it in the sense that our re extension rates is zero. So while we may say that the UK does not That's use correct. frozen section, we cognizant of the fact the reaccession rate is close to 20%. And in the US, you know, if you look at the range of reaccession, it is close to 20 to 50%, which is huge. So I think, uh, you know, in places where the pathologist becomes comfortable with the um, uh, frozen section procedure, it, it is a very, very useful technique. Great point, Gita, and you, I agree with you, but a lot of times, uh, things don't freeze. That's what they say. And it is very, very likely that they may miss it. But if somebody is doing it routinely and you have a pathologist you can swear by, it's obviously indicated and makes sense to have it. But naturally, it's not a structural biology, a structural histology that you'll get a report of. They'll also be taking bites here and there. But I agree with you. If you have, if you have a reliable uh, I mean, pathologist who you can trust on, it's, it's definitely on and it should be done. I agree with you. Right. Was well, I audible? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. You were, you were audible. Yeah. Dr. Vishali, you want to take on those questions, Dr. Vishali? Uh, is Dr. Vishali muted? Sorry. Muted. She's muted. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. Dr. Vishali, you're unmuted now. Yeah. So there are two more questions. One uh, from Dr. Saurabh again. Uh, he wants to know, uh, uh, for Dr. Nita, whether she can elaborate on the technique of use of ICG. So, um, um, what we've been doing with ICGs with the iSpy cam, um, we've tried it for some of the mastectomy flaps when we've done skin sparing or nipple sparing mastectomies. Uh, I will say it's not been 100% accurate, but what we're, our plastic surgery team is more keen on specifically when you're doing perforator or three flaps. Primarily because of that zone four when you're doing a three flap tends to give you a lot of trouble in a DF. And that zone four has is something that we're looking at being able to evaluate with ICG. We are looking to do a prospective evaluation. I think Aini, if she's here to tell you about it, is looking at a evaluation and patients using the ICG for prediction of the area of necrosis later. But um, I think literature itself is divided on the use of ICG.
Vishali is muted again. Oh, sorry. I think this I think that's the okay. yeah, Shubham. Yeah, yeah. This I, 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 I can't look at seven screens at one time. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'll read out the question. Sorry. So Dr. Saurav is asking again. Uh, I'll unmute him, Dr. Vishal. So uh, can you comment on uh, cavity shape? So uh, I think the question is that uh, should it be done routinely or selectively in uh, BCTs? So we don't. Uh, I think as long as you've done a wide, good wide excision, you're happy with your cross margins on your tumor. If you are substantiating that with an additional frozen section with a good pathologist, that's a choice you make. But if you get um, a good wide excision, routine cavity shave is not something we do. We currently use it only if there is an additional palpable lesion or there's some suspicion in that area and we shave that specific margin. I think, I think that is all the questions that we have. Uh, I must thank Dr. Neeta that, you know, this is a very commonly asked topic and we looked into the last five year papers across universities and it's asked at least four times the same topic, you know, a short note changing to a long note and then just a, a comment, a, a, a MRM versus BCS debate for uh, the question paper. And I think what uh, everybody, all of us who have attended this should go back to this lecture. We have rec uh, done a recording for this lecture and it will be made available on our YouTube channel. The aim is that you should see at what slides Dr. Neeta have put. She has also mentioned the papers from which she has taken those images or those references. So it is important to go through those also. And, we, you know, each of us must go through this lecture again and take down, jot down the important points if you want to create a short note or a long note, uh, depending on the type of question it comes, because it is really comprehensive. And I think we will treasure this and this will be uh, available for a long time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neeta. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Dr. Geeta, you want to take the quiz questions now? <laughs> yeah, I, I can do I that. I want to hear the answers to them. <laughs> so I, had, I had a small, you know, points to remember kind yes, of, a, yes, yes. you know, sorry, sorry. Just, just a reinforcement. I think Neeta has done a wonderful job. She has, you know, I think we picked up all those things that I wanted to say, but uh, it is always good to reinforce a few things. Uh, before we uh, before we go back, um, like I said, Nita has covered all of them very very well, and uh, you should make this uh, a habit, you know, because we want to really launch into oncoplasty. All of those points that Nita was so beautifully illustrated in her presentation are like you know pearls of wisdom, which uh, need to be incorporated in your practice. Are you sharing screen? Uh, it's it's already on. Can you see it? Yeah. Ah, okay. Wait a sec. No, no. Why Should I reshare it if you can't see it? No, I can't no, see it. Yeah, yeah, just a second. Just a second. I'll okay. reshare it. Sometimes it happens. Yeah. Okay, now. Why is it showing a small in mine? Can everybody else see it? No, not yet. I'm sorry. Should I share it from my end? Yeah, yeah, you, you can share it. You can share it, Dr. Gita. 